This is Aesthetics Bites, a series for Philosophy Bites with me, Nigel Warburton. And me, David Edmonds. Aesthetics Bites is made in association with the London Aesthetics Forum and made possible by a grant from the British Society of Aesthetics. All cultures have forms of artistic expression. From an evolutionary standpoint, this seems a bit odd. After all, it's not obvious what evolutionary advantage there is to writing poetry, or even just appreciating poetry. Stephen Davies, welcome to Aesthetics Bites. Thank you for having me. The topic we're going to talk about is art and evolution. So, what's the connection? How are art and evolution related? Different people have different theories about this, but there are three positions that I distinguish. The first is that art is an adaptation, that is to say it's a, a measure of fitness and it predicts who will have more children or better children. Another possibility is that it's a byproduct of an adaptation but it doesn't contribute anything biologically of its own. And the third position is that it's a cultural technology. Of course, like everything, it will depend in the end on evolution, but it will be sufficiently removed from it that we can think of it as a cultural creation. So we're talking about why it is, from an evolutionary perspective, that art evolved and artists started making things. And so if it's an adaptation, what sort of candidates are there? What sort of adaptation would painting pictures on a wall or carving stag's antlers, what sort of adaptation would that be? Again, there would be different theories. One possibility is that it's a way of showing that you have useful skills, but a different one is that it's a complete waste of time. But it is so expensive and interesting that you waste your time this way that it shows that you're so fit that you can afford to do this useless thing. So that's a bit like the peacock's tail. It's an elaborate display to show great genetic fitness. It doesn't serve any role in terms of flying or anything. It's just signalling, look, I'm so strong, I can carry around this huge tail. That is correct. On that version, this is called the theory of sexual selection, and the view that I've just described is advocated by an evolutionary psychologist called Jeffrey Miller. But there are other possibilities. So it could be an adaptation for benefits that it brings in terms of group security or bonding, sharing values, transmitting the religion or the beliefs, whatever it is that keeps the group solid. So art is often used to enhance ritual, and ritual is crucial in cementing the group. I'm slightly sceptical about this kind of evolutionary approach because it's a kind of just-so story, isn't it? It was a how did the elephant get its trunk? How did the artist come to be a common feature of every society? And you tell a, a story. You tell a story which is very hard to prove because it's a kind of reverse engineering. You think, well, the artist must have been there for a particular evolutionary reason. And yet there's no easy way to discriminate between alternative hypotheses there. I agree with that entirely. Well, I should say there are as many just so byproduct stories and technology stories as there are adaptationist stories. But it is true that where you get many competing stories about what it's an adaptation for, and indeed where these stories compete, so some might say it's men showing off and others say it bonds the group, those seem to be in competition. So when you've got a lot of stories and they don't agree, then that's a reason for being sceptical of all of them. I mean, even if they're true, or one of them is true, or a number of them are true, we don't have access to sufficient evidence to determine which one is true. There are things that would count as evidence. If you've got dedicated neural circuitry for the task that's specific to art, that would be good evidence that it was an adaptation. The problem is that we don't find these things normally. And to take, as an example, music, it uses a lot of the brain, it overlaps almost completely with language, and we don't know which came first. Wouldn't it follow that if art really were adaptive biologically, that artists would end up having more children? Well, that is the measure of biological success. Either they need better quality children, or they need more children. And there isn't much empirical evidence for either hypothesis. Anecdotally, though, successful artists, at least successful novelists, are sexually attractive and often quite promiscuous. And, you know, there is a connection, at least in our culture, between being a successful artist and going through the motions of procreation. 
It can appear that way, but though the measure of success isn't the number of people you sleep with, it's the number of children you have. And even if um, Jimi Hendrix slept with lots of people, I don't think he's got many heirs. But beyond that, it's only recently that artists have become stars in this kind of way. Formerly, they were employed by the church or by the aristocracy, and they were servants. So the person who would have attracted the mates is the one who could afford to pay someone to write a symphony rather than the person who wrote the symphony. Let's go on to the hypothesis that art evolved as a byproduct of some other evolutionary adaptation. What sort of story would you tell there? That view is held by many biologists, and they would identify crucial adaptations as things like intelligence, imagination, humour, and the idea would be that once you've got creatures that have mastered those kinds of skills, then they have the capacity to go on to make art, even if art doesn't make a biological contribution. And art, of course, still would be culturally valuable, even if it isn't an adaptation. But what is interesting is that we are dedicated artists, that is to say all of us. We put in an extraordinary amount of effort in mastering some arts, as long as we have a fairly broad view of what arts are. You think of your friends, you know, one of them will be an expert on Hollywood movies <laughs> and another will have a passion for certain kinds of music, an expert on country and western music and so on. So in that sense, even if we're not all artists or performers, we often have a deep understanding and appreciation of art. Perhaps even more remarkably, art is incredibly important in conditions of the worst kinds of scarcity. If you think about people in concentration camps, a number of people were drawing, were making music, were actually discussing literature. Now what you say is true, and indeed the Ice Age art was done during the Ice Age, so when uh, conditions were very tough for the people. So art provides a, a certain kind of solace, even if it's also a costly enterprise. But we do pay that cost even under conditions of harshness. It seems to me that any adequate evolutionary account will have to be able to explain why people would devote energy to making artworks when it's obviously at the cost of doing something like getting food or protecting yourself from enemies. Well, if you're an adaptationist, you'll think of advantages that we get from doing this. It could be that we attract higher quality mates. It could be that we cement the group and its values more securely by sharing these things. Certainly in early cultures, art tends to involve everybody in the group. It's not a thing done by isolated individuals for their own benefit, usually. But if it's a byproduct, surely if the byproduct is very costly, the practice of making art results in people dying young because they're not defending themselves or they're not looking for food, then it would quite quickly be selected out. It would be selected out if there were differences between us. But if we all do this and we all pay the cost, then, <laughs> then it's not going to do any selecting. Why would anybody believe the byproduct account? Because it's hard to find biological substrates for the relevant art behaviours that could be inherited genetically. Because biological substrates for storytelling are just the same as those for regular conversation and so on and so on. We've discussed two ways of understanding where art came from. One in terms of adaptation, one in terms of the byproduct of some other adaptation. What about this third idea that art is really a technology? The idea here is that it depends mainly on culture. Like everything, it depends on our evolved biological capacities, but at a sufficient distance that we can treat it as a, a cultural product. To give some examples of these, mathematics and reading aren't adaptations, but they're very valuable, and we could best think of them as cultural technologies. And so the range of things that we call art piggybacks on our other adaptive aspects that allowed us to become a species that flourishes. And so we have this ability to see and to represent and to imagine. And these capacities then led to this technology art, which is culturally transmitted. Yes, that's the idea. Though we don't have to think of this as high-end culture. It can be a modest notion of art in which we all participate. Could you give me another example, maybe, just to get clear what you mean by a technology? Because it's not obvious that reading is a technology. We usually talk of the printing press as the technology. Well, making fire is an example. We've been doing this, or indeed species before us, for three or four hundred thousand years. 
But there is no gene for making fire. It's something we teach each generation because it's such a valuable activity. In the case of reading, I mean speaking, learning a language is an adaptation, but people didn't learn to read until 5,000 years ago. And what they ended up using is a bit of the brain that's involved in recognising shapes and, as it were, bent that towards reading and writing. Do you yourself endorse any of these three approaches, with adaptation, the spin-off approach, or the technology account of art? Those three set the framework in terms of which most people talk about this question, and I'm sceptical of the answers that they provide using that framework. I've come to think that these are not the best way of connecting art and evolution, and that's because it's very difficult to make a sensible separation for our species between culture and biology. The two interact and work hand in hand. And so the question about is this a biological adaptation or is it a cultural technology tries to separate and force them apart in a way that is going to be simplifying or reducing the issue. But it's true that within the subject of aesthetics there has been a real interest in giving evolutionary accounts of various art forms. That is true, though this is a recent phenomenon. And the push here comes mainly from people who work in the arts rather than from people who do evolutionary biology. It would certainly secure the value of art if we could say that it was a biological adaptation. But even if we can't say that, we can say that it connects deeply with human nature because it's universal, it's found everywhere, and its value culturally can't be doubted. But they want something even more secure as a basis for this value. And so you get the turn to biology. Is this an example of a kind of scientism, a feeling that we need to be able to explain art in terms of biological science or we can't possibly understand it? I don't think it can be that because even if biology explained why we started doing it, art is so culturally inflected that it's not really going to explain what makes for good art now. So if that was what we were looking for, this wouldn't be a good way to go. Does this mean that you think philosophers should be looking elsewhere for an understanding of art? They shouldn't be going to biology because that, that implies this sort of crude distinction between biology and culture, which is unsustainable. I think we've got a lot to learn from all the sciences as philosophers. And at the very least, our theory shouldn't be incompatible with the best science. So I don't think we should turn away from this. And we could indeed learn a lot by trying to pick through the questions that come up. So it's not that I think we should stop talking in this way about art, but we need to be very careful how we express ourselves. Stephen Davies, thank you very much. Thank you. For more information about Aesthetics Bites, go to www.londonaestheticsforum.org. And for more information about Philosophy Bites and how to support us, go to www.philosophybites.com. Mm-hmm.